So today's video is going to be slightly different and I'm going to be using some power tools unsupervised. So this is going to be fun. Hello friends and welcome to a new video. So the last time I used power tools on this channel, I think it was when I made my needle lace pillow stand holder thing. No, at that time I was actually visiting my parents so I had full access to my dad's workshop. And if you haven't seen that video I will link it up top or down in the description if you want to see that process. So for today I'm going to be using power tools. Not gonna lie, I'm really hoping I don't lose any fingers. I am I am a little bit nervous about doing this unsupervised, but you know what? I'm just gonna get over that and uh, I'm gonna create something fun today. So this project, as you've seen by the title, is going to be creating an extension for my domestic sewing machine. So when I looked at purchasing a extension table, it was really expensive and it didn't come to the size like they were much smaller sizes than what I was wanting. So I decided that, you know what? I'm, I'm a little bit handy and I'm just gonna create my own extension. So yeah, it's gonna be an interesting process. I hope this goes well. If I'm posting this video and I still have all 10 fingers, then I'm gonna count it as a success. <laughs> So anyways, I think I've done enough of an intro for this video and it's time to get started on the project. Okay, so I have my machine here. Just take this off. So the extension table that I want to create, I would like it to come, I guess, this far out. So the full throat of my machine will have a table coming out. So my machine this part of the throat is just a straight edge that I don't think I'll have any difficulties with but this right here does have a bevel so I know right away that I don't have any Dremel tools that I can kind of create a bevel with so I think it's it's gonna have a little gap here which what that is yeah that's about a three inch gap um, that will have a little area that is gonna be a little bit uh, funky but I am okay with that if I decide that I need to change it in the future that is a problem for future Marika to deal with all right so I have the cardboard here I have a sharpie and I'm just gonna trace around this now my plan for this is to have the table stick out about an additional three inches from this part of the table here um, so I guess that's three inches and then the the rest of the board will hang off that way and also um, I'm thinking of rounding a corner right here where the board is going to come out from. Again guys I am not an expert at this. I am just having fun and because this is a cardboard template um, I will be able to change this up a lot more before I actually get to the wood portion of this so I don't waste anything. This to there and then just straighten this up a lot again I'd rather this be a little bit too small right now and then I can just make it a little bit bigger as I go I am just gonna cut this out to see if the general shape is correct and again, it is better for it to be a little on the snug side and then I can change it as I go. So you can kind of see with this side, it fits good there. This fits good. This is going to be how much is sticking out, which is a nice area. Um, yeah, and now it's uh, going to the next step. All right, so I have my shape for my sewing machine. Now the board that I have for my sewing table. So it is a project panel for woodworking. It is solid spruce. So it is three quarters of an inch wide. It is 16 inches by 36 inches wide. So I looked up some tips for cutting with a jigsaw 
and everything I saw said that you want to have the side that's going to face up for your project facing down when you're cutting it. Just because the way the blade goes, it will cause splinters the way, because the, the, so if you look at the blades on these things, the cut marks um, of the blade are facing upwards, which means when it is cutting it, it is going to pull the wood up towards the jigsaw. So by having the pretty side of your work facing down, then you won't have to deal with any splinters pushing downward. Starting things off, I secured the board to my workplace with clamps and then I cut the board to the length I wanted. And then very carefully, I cut around the corners. Now, it took me a couple times to figure out how to cut the corners nicely, and I think I got the hang of it by the last one. I then lined up the template along both edges and traced around it. Now, I'm tracing around upside down because I am cutting from the bottom. And then I double checked my lines with my L ruler to make sure they were nice and clear for cutting. Also, to make things a little bit easier to cut out the concave corners, I drilled just inside of the line I marked. Now, this would have worked better if I had a drill bit that was big enough for the jigsaw blade to turn in, but unfortunately that was not the case. So I did have to make a few extra cuts to get some nice straight corners. And then it was time for a fit test. This was pretty close. There was a little area in the back that needed to be shaved off just a little bit, but it's not too bad if I do say so myself. After shaving that off off camera, it was time to start some sanding. So when it comes to sanding by hand, I like to put on some K-pop music and just dance around because I find that the most enjoyable thing to do. So I started off with an 80 grit sanding paper and I sanded off all the corners and all the edges just to make everything kind of smooth and the top of the board super soft. After I'd finished the initial sanding, I then grabbed some wood filler and patched up any dense cracks or nicks, and then I let it dry. So once everything was dry, I then started drilling the pilot holes for the legs of the table and the top of the table. Now the pilot holes help keep the board from splitting when I add the screws, and so it's very good to do that unless you want to be dealing with a board that has split. With the legs attached, I then filled the screw holes with more wood filler and let it dry overnight. The next day, I then sanded everything down once again. This time, I started with the 100 grit sandpaper and I worked my way up to the 220. So there's so much sanding. Once it was beautifully sanded, I then cleaned up all the dust, which took a while, and then set everything up to varnish it. Now I did contemplate staining the wood darker, but because the weather's been touch and go lately and I have to do this outside, I didn't want to run into the issue of varnishing this when it was damp outside. So I opted just to leave it natural and to coat it with a clear semi-gloss to keep things simple. Now the varnish needs at least three coats, so this process does take a little while because it needs to dry fully before you sand it down a little bit with the 400 grit paper or higher, and then coat it again. So between each coat, it does get a light sanding just to help get that glossy smooth finish, so the fabric will just glide right over it. 
It takes a lot of elbow grease, but once it is done, it is beautiful. And now it is time for some B-roll. Well, crap. No, I went really deep in. Mm -hmm. 